Thank you, David, and hi, everyone. Um, as David said, my name is Anushka Concepcion, and I'm an extension educator with the Connecticut Sea Grant Program and UConn's Cooperative Extension System. And I will be talking about seaweed farming and what we can do with the seaweed that we farm. So just to go over what seaweeds are for folks that are not familiar, um, they are not plants. They do photosynthesize like plants do, and they do have structures that resemble components of plants like leaves and stems, but physiologically they're different organisms. Seaweed are macroalgae. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of microalgae, but then obviously this is the, the macro version of the microalgae. Um, there are three types of seaweeds, the reds like Irish moss, browns like sugar kelp, and greens like sea lettuce or ulva. Um, and then the colors, um, the designated color, the designation of colors have to do with the types of photosynthetic components um, that are in um, the, these seaweed uh, tissues. So seaweeds are important for a variety of reasons. They contribute to a healthy coastal ecosystem. They extract nutrients um, and contaminants out of the water. Um, they also provide habitat for marine organisms um, as well as food uh, for those organisms and food for humans. Seaweeds are also versatile. They could be used in a wide variety of applications. Not all seaweeds are created equally. And so it's important to note that we can't use seaweeds all species of seaweeds in the same way. Seaweeds are special in their own way and they have certain components that are appropriate for certain applications. So uh, this graph um, shows the global production of wild harvest seaweed, uh, which is the orange lines at the bottom, um, and compares that to the production of farmed seaweed. And around the 1980s, you can see from the graph, there's this major shift from the global production of harvested seaweed um, through farmed um, production as opposed to wild harvest. And that's a trend pretty much that we're seeing with a lot of aquaculture species. But really, I mean, it's with the seaweeds, when we think of seaweeds and how seaweeds are, are produced now, majority of it is coming from farm sources. And the two countries um, from FAO's um, latest data um, that are leaders in producing the most volume are China and Japan. And just to let you know about the, um, the market demand in North America alone for seaweed and well, mostly seaweed components as well, was valued at um, just over $11 billion. So seaweed may seem like an innocuous type of organism, but there's a really huge demand and interest. So I was asked to talk a little bit about how seaweed is produced. And so while hundreds of species are being cultivated all around the world, we also cultivate um, a few varieties and species in the United States. The most commonly produced species is sugar kelp or Saccharina latissima. And sugar kelp is a brown macroalgae. It is, it's a winter crop. So um, uh, juvenile kelp, the nursery um, stage occurs in the fall. Um, the lines are deployed in the fall and then uh, grows throughout the winter. And then it's harvested in the late spring, um, anywhere between two to three months, depending upon the region. Seaweeds, especially, um, uh, a sugar kelp is very nutritious. Um, it's a delicious edible species. It contains dietary fiber, essential amino acids, iodine, magnesium, and other trace elements, um, but also vitamins, vitamins A, B, C, and E. So it's extremely nutritious, very healthy, and very delicious as well. If you haven't tried it, trust me, it's good. Uh, so just a quick overview on how sugar kelp is produced, how we farm it. So we are still reliant, majority of nurseries are still reliant on wild stocks. And so around the fall, um, we go out, we look for um, kelp blades that have this black band on it. That's the source tissue. And the source tissue contains thousands of spores. We bring the source tissue into the lab, into the nursery, give it essentially different light and temperature treatments. The spores get released. It's collected and then it's inoculated or all those spores are inoculated into the tank. And the middle photo here um, shows you um, everything that a that, uh, basic nursery uh, system. And so in this tank, there's filtered seawater, nutrients and light. And what looks like tubes are PVC pipe with string wrapped around it. And the string serves as a substrate for the spores. And the spores settle into um, the string and then they grow out. Then picture next to the tank essentially looks like 
PVC with fuzz on it. The fuzz are actually the juvenile kelp blades. And when they get to approximately two millimeters in length, that's the, it's then ready to be deployed out into the environment. And how that's done is the seeded string uh, gets wrapped around the grow line. And then, of course, the last picture you can see, uh, this is in the middle of uh, the growing season for sugar kelp. Um, uh, the kelp then starts to grow um, right off of that line and then ready for harvest around um, anywhere between April and June. This is the basic schematic of a farm design. Uh, but the farm design is going to differ and vary um, depending upon region, of course, depending upon site. All farming is pretty much site specific, um, as well as scale of operation. So um, essentially, the farm design is the grow line, the long line or grow line that's attached to two buoys um, anchored to the bottom. And as the kelp grows, it becomes very heavy. It's mostly water. And so in order to maintain it in the water column, um, flotation buoys are added. It's important to find that sweet spot for kelp. Again, it's gonna differ with location and growing conditions because kelp is photosynthetic. So we want it to have access to sunlight, but we also don't want it exposed to the air because in the winter time, we don't want the tissues to freeze. So again, it's just trying to find that sweet spot. In some places it may be more shallow. Um, in other places, kelp is, is uh, produced in deeper water. So these are some quick videos on how kelp is harvested. The first video I'll show you was provided um, to me by my Sea Grant colleague, Jacqueline Robidoux uh, with Maine Sea Grant. And this video essentially shows how kelp is harvested. It's pretty much done similarly um, across the country. Uh, we use this process as well in Connecticut. Um, so essentially the kelp is just literally cut from the lines into some sort of container. In this case, um, this farmer was using um, bags or totes, and then um, the totes are then taken um, to the dock and then processed. And in Alaska, my colleague, uh, Missy Good um, from Alaska Sea Grant um, sent me this photo. Kelp farms are much bigger in Alaska and therefore mechanized um, harvesting techniques have to be utilized. What's Really cool about the fact that the biomass is so, so large. Um, what the farmers do is they have these floating totes um, that they pack full of kelp um, and then it gets tendered back to the, uh, the dock for processing. A little about um, processing, because kelp contains very high uh, water, um, or very high level of water in its tissues, it has a very short shelf life. And so it's really important to process the seaweed or uh, stabilize the seaweed in some form um, as soon as possible to maintain product quality. And so these are just some techniques um, that some farmers, but mostly first step processors employ when they receive uh, raw seaweed. There's blanching, uh, which is the first photo. Um, so blanching is not cooking as we want to preserve the enzymes. It's a way to just sort of fix the kelp so that product quality is maintained. Uh, there's drying or dehydration. Um, uh, one farmer in Connecticut was, was trying out flash freezing. He said the quality was great, but the cost to do it was exorbitant. And he decided not to do that, but he just took this really cool photo. It provides an option as well for folks that are interested. Um, and then this picture came, the last photo came from, again, uh, Missy from Maine Sea Grant. Um, what this company does is they blanch kelp and then they vacuum pack it and store it. And then all the kelp then gets um, sold to value added processors. So I'm gonna switch gears and now and talk about, uh, just th sort of throw some numbers at you about the status of the industry in the United States. When we talk about seaweed farming in the United States, we have to talk about Maine. Maine has been producing seaweed and also seaweed products for 60 years. While the industry in Maine is mostly, um, or is predominantly wild harvest, um, they wild harvest rockweed, which is used for a lot of non-food commodities, fertilizers and animal feeds and, and things like that. There is um, an aquaculture industry that's beginning to increase in order to supplement um, the seaweed that's being utilized uh, for food. Um, in Maine, they cultivate three species of seaweed, so sugar kelp, skinny kelp, as well as wing kelp. There are a lot of farms in Maine. Um, there's more than 200 sites growing 
a combination of shellfish as well as seaweed. And then there's also some standalone seaweed farms as well. The numbers for farmed kelp, a combination of farmed kelp 2020, um, for the 2020 landings um, was approximately 500,000 pounds. So significant amount of seaweed that's being produced solely through farming. Uh, these are just some examples of the value added food products that the farm product um, gets diverted to. Things like kimchi, see, uh, kelp kimchi and seaweed salads and smoothies and, and powders and flakes. And these companies, again, have been <clears throat> have dedicated many, many years to developing these products and then scaling up their manufacturing. And so they're at a point where you can go online and you can order directly from their websites. All right, so <clears throat> moving down the East Coast, we have Maine and then we have everyone else. <laughs> and so I put all of us, the, the everyone else, Connecticut included, um, into this table uh, because we're, our, the scales of operations are very similar, um, which is but then different from Maine, smaller than Maine. Um, so really what I want you to take home from this table are the similarities. So from New Hampshire down to New York, we're all growing sugar kelp. We're all selling sugar kelp um, in its fresh raw form because we don't really have processing facilities um, available or access to as many processing facilities like they have in Maine. And we're all mostly selling our sugar kelp to, um, as, as a food directly to restaurants. Um, one thing I want you to also notice is the call or the row of number of farms. There are a good amount of farms, you know, for considering the size of our operations, which are very small, that have been permitted. However, just picking on Connecticut, I can since I work in Connecticut, We've had 13 commercial farms that have been permitted since 2001. However, only three are active. There's several reasons why. Um, I'm going to talk more about that in uh, when I get to barriers. Um, but just keep that in mind, um, that while there's interest and while there's a lot of permitting that um, have or farms that have been established, not everyone's farming. And also not every farm is farming at capacity. Um, so, again, I'll talk more about um, some of the reasons why um, in a minute. I want to switch now all the way to the other side of the country and going to Alaska. Alaska by far produces in volume biomass um, the largest amount of farmed seaweed in open water systems. They produce a combination of sugar kelp, ribbon kelp, and bull kelp. Um, out of the 22 sites permitted, um, seven have been active, uh, consistently active. Um, just for numbers, just under 540,000 pounds of a combination of these species of kelps um, were harvested last year. Um, unlike Southern New England, and similarly to Maine, Alaska is not selling um, their seaweed in its raw fresh form. They are stabilizing it as soon as possible. Um, Ways of stabilizing include drying, blanching, and freezing. And then all that seaweed is diverted to uh, value-added or to producing value-added products. So really food production um, is the dominant commodity and ideal um, market outlet uh, for seaweeds. Uh, the rest of the West Coast, again, we'll lump those folks together. Um, sorry about that. Um, but really, uh, in addition to the different types of species that they produce, it's important to note that most of the commercial farms are land-based um, and the only open water farms, there's one in Washington that produces sugar kelp and then one in California that's more of a nonprofit research farm. They're also producing sugar kelp as well as bull kelp. Um, the seaweed that's being produced or I should say farmed um, is also going to food um, and human consumption as well as some being sold as, fr uh, as fresh. <clears throat> so, Switching gears now to talking about barriers. I uh, don't want to sound like a Debbie Downer, but I want you to keep in mind that these are very realistic challenges um, that um, folks in extension like myself get asked a lot about. Um, and it's the barriers that sort of keep all of us busy and trying to help folks navigate them and also address them. But I also want you to keep in mind that barriers also present an opportunity. So, um, I challenge all of you to start thinking about how you would realistically um, address some of these barriers in an achievable way. Um, <clears throat> some of these barriers, while they're similar across the country, they're very nuanced by region, but also by scale of production and size of operation. Have to start off with markets. Market dictates everything. 
if a farmer can't sell their crop, they're not going to grow it. Um, so um, just, you know, basic, basic business planning is key um, in this case. Um, <clears throat> some of the challenges faced by farmers who are selling their seaweed in its raw, fresh form um, in, in terms of establishing long-term um, markets uh, is the fact that when they're selling in a raw form, they have to sell them in uh, sell their seaweed in very small batches, but also move the seaweed as quickly as possible. Um, some of these farmers, uh, or uh, some farmers, especially in Connecticut, have said to me, "You know, it's it's challenging when I'm bringing my seaweed um, to some potential markets because it's not necessarily the same seaweed that is being imported into the U.S. And what we import is not native, so we don't grow it." Um, Sure, kelp may, may not necessarily be used in the same way, but that doesn't mean it's not similar. And so it's trying to provide, um, or, or folks have been really inventive and innovative in terms of how they market their fresh crop um, so that it gets folks excited about trying it and demanding specifically locally produced fresh seaweed. <clears throat> Infrastructure for uh, Long-term storage for post-harvest processing and stabilization is also a challenge. Um, again, it's part of the reason why many of uh, sea many seaweed farmers are selling their seaweed in its raw form. There's just no place to process and store long-term to ensure food safety, but also product quality. Some of the challenges uh, small-scale farmers face are the cost of real estate, um, cost of utilities. Um, and um, also being close, uh, located close to a place where they can have access to a processing facility. Um, and <clears throat> part of the, the challenge, I think also some farmers face is just understanding what the market wants. Do they want fresh product? Do they want dried? Do they want um, blanched, frozen? And so understanding again, going back to market will sort of dictate um, what some of this infrastructure may look like. Have to talk about regulations, right? So <laughs> there's always there's always issues <clears throat> and challenges um, navigating any regulatory process. Um, but you know, and again, that's going to differ with state. There's some states that have a well-defined regulatory process for both permitting and food safety, and there's other states that are just starting out. And so again, navigating through this process and figuring out what works best for a farmer and even what information regulatory agencies need um, can also be challenging. Um, for example, with permitting, uh, what does the permitting structure look like? Um, you know, how much does it cost to go through the permitting process? How long is it going to take? Also, from food safety um, perspective, if a farmer is selling their seaweed raw, are there food safety concerns that they need to be aware of? It's one thing if um, a farmer has the ability to menu, to process their seaweed, to stabilize their seaweed in a safe way. Um, but raw food, there are potential food safety hazards. But farmers ask me, you know, do I need to take a food safety training course? If so, how much does that cost and how long is that gonna take? So when developing business plans and planning out um, the um, kelp farming process, a lot of it actually has to do with the post-harvest challenges, right? The markets post-harvest as opposed to just growing. Um, and so it's sort of like a shift in mindset to say, you know, yeah, you know, I can farm seaweed, but then what? And so let me shift my energy and focus on the now what um, in order to be a successful farmer. And I also added production um, for two reasons, uh, especially in Southern New England and Connecticut specifically, we've had challenges with weather and how weather impacted farming. For example, there's been some years where we've had icing of lines as well as nor'easters that have uh, torn apart kelp lines uh, resulting in crop losses. And so preparing for that situation without violating your permit um, <clears throat> also has to be um, taken into account. And also some of our farmers have um, faced challenges accessing seed and you can't farm anything if you don't have the seed. And there are many reasons for this. It could be location to the closest um, nursery. Um, it could be not securing contracts um, well ahead of time um, with a nursery. Um, and 
other uh, factors such as regulatory um, factors importing seed from outside of the state um, could also um, add additional barriers uh, to accessing seed. There's some concerns in some states where um, uh, or concerns with introducing a non-native strain into local waterways um, prevents a farmer from, for example, Connecticut farmer going up to Maine and saying, let me just get seed from Maine. Um, there are those regulatory barriers that prevent um, access to seed. Um, but really to sort of address some of these challenges, there are resources available. Um, so there, the, the National Sea Grant Seaweed Hub was established in 2019. It's one of 11 aquaculture hubs um, that were funded by the National Sea Grant Program. And this is a collaborative effort of 11 Sea Grant programs and their stakeholders. And essentially what we did is, you know, we hear all these questions, we hear folks talking about these challenges. And so we decided let's bring everyone together and let's let the stakeholders come up with um, solutions uh, and then develop resources based on the needs, challenges, and potential solutions on how to address these barriers. And so these are some resources that are available um, publicly accessible on seaweedhub.org. One is the state of the states. And this presentation is updated annually by all the Sea Grant programs. Um, and essentially I pulled from this presentation in order to put together my um, slides about each state. Um, and again, it just provides an overview of landings, a regulatory process, species produced, and where the, 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 spe or the seaweed is going. Um, we've also developed this quick handy infographic um, called um, the Commercially Cultivated Domestic Seaweed Aquaculture One or Seaweed 101. Um, and it's really a guide to where seaweed is grown, so which states are producing it, which species, and where it's going, where it's being sold. And then um, to address seed um, access, uh, some of the stakeholders said, you know what, let's take a step back and let's figure out where the sources are. Um, and so what came out of that conversation was the National Seaweed Nursery Directory. It's the first of its kind um, that did an assessment of um, seaweed nurseries, uh, or I should say seaweed sources across the country. Um, and then it was an opt-in nursery, or it's an opt-in directory. It's gonna be updated every year, but at least it provides farmers with a place to start, but also what restrictions and guidance there are uh, depending upon what state a farmer is located in, um, which could dictate and determine where they can source their seed from. And I did wanna give a shout out to all my Sea Grant colleagues. The Seaweed Hub is a collaborative effort. And so these are the folks that um, make the Seaweed Hub so successful. Um, so these are the folks I go to. Um, when I have a question about, you know, what's happening in Alaska or what's happening in Massachusetts. Um, so if you do have questions about a specific state, I urge you reach out to these folks. They're extremely knowledgeable. They know what's happening um, all the time. Uh, their contact information is also on the CB Hub's website. And so I wanted to now shift gears and talk about really cool potential applications, um, different ways seaweeds and components of seaweeds can be utilized. Keep in mind that a lot of these applications um, are still in the research phase or in the pilot phase. Um, they haven't been scaled up. They're not commercially or, or accessible yet to a majority of farmers, um, but here's what's happening, right? And here's what's coming on the horizon. So <clears throat> just some of, um, the applications for seaweeds include biofuels. There's a lot of federal fun funding that's been going towards investigating, um, developing biofuels out of seaweeds. Now, while the target organism are microalgae for a number of reasons, you know, microalgae can produce really large densities or high densities in a very short period of time. Um, there's interest also in utilizing the biomass from macroalgae. Um, the challenge, though, of course, comes back to processing and having biorefineries and facilities readily available to accept all the material um, and biomass and transition it into a biofuel that can be used um, really worldwide. Um, and also thinking about a, a decent amount, of, a decent price point for farmers. Remember, farmers are selling uh, right now their seaweed. Um, for food because they can get a premium price for it. It's the highest value commodity, uh, you know, which is great, which is important, 
But there's also a lot of farmers that have kelp left over, for example, um, or kelp that sort of, you know, towards the end of the growing season, the product quality may not be as great, still safe, but just may not be as great. And so these are the potential market outlets um, for some of those farmers. Um, so again, biofuels, um, hopefully soon <laughs> will be one option. Um, this is something that's really cool, biotextiles. So you may have heard of bioplastics. This is sort of you know, similar um, in terms of developing a material that can replace uh, plastics and other forms of textiles that's biodegradable. This company, Oceanium, is, is one of many companies. Um, they're based in Europe, but they're looking at utilizing macroalgae material um, to producing um, a bio, biodegradable um, textile. This is a leather-like kelp material. It's one of their prototypes. Um, that they've developed. They're also looking um, at producing prototypes for a seaweed-based ink, as well as seaweed-based films and boards. But, you know, while that sounds great, um, again, the challenge comes down to now. What's the situation now? It's, well, again, it goes back to infrastructure and having the appropriate infrastructure to be able to transition all that material into something that could be turned into um, biotextiles. And in addition to infrastructure, scaling up the technology as well um, still needs to be uh, figured out. This is something I get asked a lot about and same thing with my Steve Rant colleagues is uh, utilizing um, or incorporating seaweed into livestock feed to reduce methane emissions um, by cattle that are produced to supply the dairy and meat industries. So, the ideal candidate species, I uh, should say the, the, the one that, that's being targeted mostly um, is a non-native species, unfortunately. Um, it's a red tropical, subtropical macroalgae called Asparagopsis taxiformis. And, and by the way, this is a great resource um, developed by the World Wildlife Fund that sort of gives you an overview of, of some of the key points and uh, factors in utilizing seaweeds as a, into livestock feed. Um, but anyway, Asparagopsis taxiformis, um, contains a compound um, called bromoform. And bromoform um, has been shown to counteract the formation of methane in the cow's gut. Um, so when added to feed in um, small amounts, it's been shown to reduce methane production or cow burps, <laughs> let's be real, by almost 95%. So the the, you know, the, the data is, is, is wonderful. Um, and, uh, but again, it's part of the, the, the challenge with scaling up um, and having acceptance, um, widespread, widespread acceptance within um, the dairy industry. And the lead researchers, sorry, let me go back. The lead researchers are um, based at um, UC Davis, um, as well as other universities and globally as well. Um, here's another application um, that a lot of municipalities are interested in is utilizing seaweeds for ecosystem services, essentially cleaning up coastal waterways. Um, again, seaweeds are extractive, um, so they are really good absorbing nutrients directly out of the water column. Um, but with nutrients, they're also great at absorbing heavy metals and other chemicals and, and contaminants of concern. Um, part of the challenge with this process, though, is developing an econo long-term economically viable program that can be implemented um, where the funding source is consistent long-term. So who's gonna pay for it? How much are the farmers are gonna get? And also what to do with all that material, um, especially if there's um, high levels of contaminants, if the seaweed was, was cultivated in an area um, perhaps, or for example, that was uh, close to say shellfish farming. If that seaweed has high levels of contaminants, you can't put it back on your tomatoes. It's just gonna go right back into the food chain, right back into the ecosystem. So again, having those practical challenges addressed and having a plan in place is something that still needs to be figured out. And here's something that I just never thought about. Um, I met this amazing um, sustainable fashion designer. Her name is Runa Ray. And um, she told me this, this, this staggering number. It's, it's crazy that just the fashion industry alone, the process of dyeing fabrics and printing fabrics to make clothing, it contributes to 20% of global water wastage and water use. 
I had no idea. Um, and so she's um, implementing this ancient Japanese technique of using floating inks. Um, and I, I probably should have made this photo bigger, but you can check out her website. Um, it, the floating ink pattern uh, makes this beautiful marble, marble pattern on fabrics. And, um, <clears throat> and but, but the floating ink technique uh, requires a really viscous solution. And what she utilizes to make the solution viscous is carrageenan, carrageenan from red seaweeds. And so that is another potential application um, that can reduce global water usage if implemented um, uh, on a much broader scale. And so I think it's really important while, while the immediate um, market outlet for seaweeds is food, because again, high value commodity, really healthy, nutritious, delicious food source. It's important to not discount the other more industrial applications for seaweed. If there's an interest, um, you know, there, it justifies more investment into making some of these non-food applications um, a reality and a viable option for farmers. And I wanted to end the presentation with just, just letting you know that a lot of these conversations and that we're having in the US, challenges, barriers, opportunities, it's happening globally. So it's not just a US situation, it's a global situation. And uh, one organization, organization called the Safe Seaweed Coalition, they're focused on scaling up um, the global seaweed farming industry, building a safer seaweed industry through three pillars of safety. So it's operational safety, consumer safety and environmental safety. And you can see their website, safeseaweedcoalition.org for more information, but they're also a funding um, agency, oh, not funding agency, but they provide funding for projects that address these three pillars, that align with these three pillars um, to again, grow the industry um, in a really safe and responsible way. And that's really all I have. So thank you very much for listening um, to my presentation. 